So, uh, good evening everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, so today we'll be covering one of my uh, personal favorite subjects. And basically it's about uh, what makes a great leader. And um, actually I haven't heard the talk yet, but yesterday on a PMI conference, Steve had uh, his first talk about this subject. So with no further ado, let me give mic to Steve. So. Thank you. Is everyone awake? Oh, this... well, I guess I have flux on still, so you can't even see this, huh? It's flux. <laughs> so much better. Cool. All right, so uh, I work for a company called Made with Love. I'll talk about that in a minute. So I have this wonderful splash here. Uh, but my talk is on psychological safety, so we'll find out all about psychological safety. I'm Steve Tauber. Uh, you might know me from EMCG, that's this place where you are currently. I'm a technical product manager with Made With Love. I am the CTO of a startup called Cuddly. I am the founder of PMCG and I have many co-founders and organizers. And I also own a consulting firm called Future Branch Development, where I do talks and trainings on EM stuff. So, that's about me. What makes a team effective? This is a question I'm sure all of us have, have had before. And you probably have ideas like leadership, creativity, communication. If the employees can see impact, this will make them effective. Well, Google had the same question. What makes a team effective at Google? And they launched a project, and they called it Project Aristotle. And what was the result? The number one thing for a team to be effective is psychological safety. But what is that? It is the shared belief that team members can take individual risks. This is something that supersedes trust. Trust is about a one-on-one -on -one relationship. I can trust you, you can trust me. It's only in one direction also. Whereas psychological safety has to do with the group. Psychological safety is about if I can trust the group as a whole, and also if the group can trust me. So it's an all or none proposition. It's being vulnerable, it's speaking your mind. It's the golden rule, treat others how you want to be treated, or maybe the opposite of that, treat others how they want to be treated. So that's psychological safety. Um, I think this is especially important for Croatia because this is Hofstede's cultural dimensions. One of those dimensions is uncertainty avoidance, which is the idea that as a culture, uh, how much risk are we willing to tolerate? How much risk are we going to avoid? And you can see Croatia is 80 out of 100 compared to the United States, which is 46 out of 100. So Croatia is one of the highest, and the United States is one of the lowest. In the United States, generally, this is very stereotypical, Americans are willing to take on more risk. They will step outside of the known box, the set of procedures, and they will go and try to figure things out. Whereas that is generally not true in Croatian culture. So I think this is especially important here in Croatia. Um, so let's talk about the threats to psychological safety. Uh, so threats in general are things like public critiques and scolding, put downs, inconsistency, rigidity, favoritism, endless rules, blaming and shaming. These are things that we would say in a family unit are abuse. So why do we accept them in the workplace? So who's talking about psychological safety? Blogs certainly are. They're saying it's the key to great teamwork. They're saying that we should encourage psychological safety. And say, of course, psychological safety. Of course we're using it. Leaders are also talking about psychological safety. Harvard Business Review is saying we need it. Google says it matters. Think School is saying it's more important than ever. And Forbes is saying it is the path to high performance. Scholars are also looking into psychological safety. There's papers, more papers, more papers. This one's from 1999, nearly 20 years ago. The oldest paper I found referencing psychological safety was from 1964. So this is not a new concept. But it's probably something you haven't heard of before. Industries are also talking about psychological safety. Hospitals especially. They want their employees to come forward when they notice a mistake. For instance, if a nurse notices the wrong medication is going to be given, she needs to speak up or he needs to speak up. 
and actually confront the doctor and say, look, this is a problem. And so this is something that hospitals, they want to take mistakes and use them as opportunities to learn rather than placing blame on who is doing what wrong. With uh, sports teams, such as football, it's important for the, the players to recover quickly, even inside the same game. They need to be able to take a mistake that they just made and push it out of their mind and move forward and make the correct play next time. And in manufacturing and services, it's really important to throw out the product if it's not done properly. And so it takes guts to say, look, we need to take this and completely throw it out. And so psychological safety is used in these industries too. So I want to cover some examples of psychological safety. The first one I want to talk about is OZ214. This is a flight that happened in 2013 from Seoul to San Francisco. And they were landing in San Francisco and they noticed that they were coming in too low. So what happened? The pilot says, hey, we should go around. We should make a second landing attempt. We're too low. We're going to hit the seawall. And the pilot did that, and everything was fine. They landed. Everyone had a chance to go on a tour where they were not delayed to too much. But that's not what really happened. The plane actually crashed. Three dead, 187 injured, because the pilot was too scared to make that call. The pilot was less experienced than the co-pilot. The co-pilot was an instructor, and this is the first time the pilot was flying this particular aircraft, the 777. So the pilot thought, I'm not going to say that we should go around. I'm going to let my more experienced co-pilot do that. And they were afraid. So psychological safety here, they didn't have the confidence to confront the co-pilot, even though they were technically in charge of the cockpit, and it actually caused real damage. I want to talk about software, because most of us, I think, work in software, so. This is a story from Hawaii, 2018, early this year. There is someone working with some software, and the software they were using had, uh, the UX wasn't that great. There was lots of confusing uh, choices in the menus. And so, what does a good uh, user do? Well, they file a complaint. They say, look, you need to come in, you need to fix these menus. They're too similar, I'm gonna make a mistake. This is gonna have real problems. And what happened? Well, they did that, of course. And they had a stress-free day because they did their job well and they didn't uh, make any errors, right? No, that's not what happened. Of course not. <laughs> Instead, an alert was sent out to everyone that lives in the state of Hawaii that said, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. This, is really, this really happened. And it took 15 minutes for them to issue a correction and 38 minutes before another push alert was sent out. There was an increase in emergencies. There was an increase of car crashes. People were like speeding down the highway at 160 mile, uh, kilometers per hour. And one person even had a heart attack after reading this because he just pushed them right over the edge. The veteran employee was blamed for the incident and fired. And I bet if there's one person in the entire world that won't make that mistake again, it's probably that guy. This is what that menu looked like, just so you know. So we'll talk about a positive example now. <laughs> I don't want to depress everyone. Uh, so imagine you are working on a production line or a factory worker, and part of your job is receiving equipment from the person in front of you, and you need to inspect it, maybe make some additional changes, and then pass it on. And you notice a problem. Well, wouldn't it be nice if you had a big red button you could press, and it stops everything, and you're able to take the time you need in order to solve the problem? Wouldn't that be great? Well, it turns out that that thing exists. It's called an and-on board, and it's something that Toyota invented, or at least they use it quite extensively. And it's a literal hanging rope above the station of a factory worker, and they can pull the, pull the cord at any point and stop the entire production line. And this is something that employees are encouraged to use because the idea is that you stop the line, you do a root cause analysis, find out what's going on, fix the problem, and then continue working. But when a new factory is launched, it's used uh, quite a bit, so they really encourage this. I want, to, uh, I want everyone to put their hands up in the air, please. And I'm gonna ask, how many times is this used per day in a new Toyota factory, okay? So keep your hands up if you think it's five times per day. If you don't think it's that much, put your hand down. 50 times per day. If you think that's too much, put your hands down. 500 times per day. If you think that's too much, put your hands down. 5,000 times per day. Is that too much? Put your hands down. One person has their hand kind of halfway up. 
5,000 times per day when a new factory is launched. That's how often the production line stops. So that gives you an idea about how the employees feel. They feel very comfortable pulling that cord because, <laughs> because they want to actually fix the problems and move forward. So what can I do? As a project manager or a team leader, how can I help my employees have psychological safety? How can I actually encourage them to stand up and speak and argue with me and tell me no and tell me that we're doing things wrong? So there's three things we can do. Measure, learn, and take action. So we're gonna talk about measuring first. So the first thing, of course, you can do surveys. Uh, this is a quantitative uh, result. And generally you have a survey that's like, I agree, I disagree, I strongly disagree, that sort of survey. Please make it anonymous. So examples of questions you can ask. I am treated with dignity and respect every day. I am recognized and thanks for contributions. I am not afraid to be myself at work. And you can also ask reverse questions such as, my mistakes are held against me. So you don't want positive results on this. Someone acts deliberately to undermine my efforts or it's difficult to ask peers for help. And this gives you at least a baseline of what's going on with your organization. And from there, later on, when we're learning and taking actions, we can compare it. Um, you need to have a rhythm with surveys, and I think two times a year is reasonable. Another thing you can do is have one-on-ones. One-on-ones are usually manager and direct report meetings, but if you're a project manager, there's no reason you can't have them with team members on your team. Um, they're not a status update. And this is something that a lot of people get wrong. It's, uh, it's a meeting that's purpose is to build the relationship between you and, and your, usually your direct report. And if you notice in this photo, there's no computer in the photo. And the reason for that is because it's a distraction. You're trying to build a relationship with someone. So you want to do that directly. You take a pen and a paper, make some notes. But another thing you can do is get out of the office, go for a walk. So what is the format of a one-on-one -on -one meeting? It's a 30-minute meeting every week on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Not Monday, because Mondays are busy. Not Friday, because it's every week. And if you miss the meeting, you have no time to make it up. If your meeting is on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, you still have an extra day in the week to make it up. You're generally gonna split the time with the person you're meeting with 50-50. And the direct report always goes first. And the reason for this is you don't want to lead the conversation. You want the, the direct report to come to you and talk about what they care about, not what you care about, because you have that positional power. So you're always going to start this the same way. You're going to start with the question, how's it going? And the reason for this is it doesn't lead the person down a path. Um, I'm sure you've heard the saying, relationships are the key to business. So why don't you have one with every single one of your direct reports? Why don't you have one with every single one of your peers? I think that's really important. And this is a good start in that direction. Another thing you can do is skip levels. So if you have a whole team that reports to you, instead of just talking with your direct reports, every now and then you can talk to their subordinates as well. And this is a way that you can hear about information that isn't trickling up to you. So we'll move on to the next category, learn. There's two facets for learning. One is internal and one is external. We'll cover internal first. And we'll start with code reviews. So this is probably something you've heard of since I think most of us work in software. If you don't know, a code review is when a coworker is checking your work. It creates a conversation about the work that's being performed. And this is really important because it's not necessarily a critique of the work, but you want to ask questions like, why did you solve this problem in this way? And what are, uh, what are some of the negative uh, impacts of solving the problem this way? So you want to create that conversation. And this is a daily opportunity to improve, so it's extremely useful for the person doing the work. One thing you have to look out for, though, is resentment, because there can be this like artist-critic kind of relationship. If you have a dedicated quality assurance team, for instance. So it's good to try to like embed those teams together and make sure that quality is part of the team, so it's not someone external constantly criticizing your work. Another thing you can do is a retrospective, and you probably have seen something like this where people are putting uh, sticky notes on a, on a whiteboard or a wall. This is your excuse to do that, finally. 
So um, what kind of agenda would you have for a retrospective if you've never attended one before? Generally, you start with a one-word summary of how you feel about the work that's been going on. So you might have a retrospective about the last two weeks, or you might have a retrospe retrospective about the entire project, or you might have a retrospective covering one specific facet of the work, such as we just implemented this new authentication system, how do we feel about it? Um, after everyone writes down a one-word description, such as happy, disappointed, uh, frustrated, things like that, then you move on and you spend about 20 minutes covering what happened. And so people are writing down post notes, putting them on the wall. And these are major events, both good and bad. So you want to cover the you want to cover the things that happen, and it's important to stick to just the facts. Try not to place blame. Well, we'll get to that in the next section, which is called why. So why do these major events happen? Um, of course, you're not actually going to put blame on your colleagues. We don't want to have them feel threatened. Uh, so here, you're trying to do root cause analysis for the groups of things and the what happened, um, and at that point, hopefully you are able to move on to the ideate stage where you can come up with some ways to make sure that the good things happen again and the bad things don't happen again. At this point, you'll generate a big list of things to do and because we can't do them all, you want to assign deliverables. So take the only the top three to five things that you've ideated on, the only the three to five best ones. And those are gonna be actual deliverables that you assign out for the, the next time uh, the project starts or a similar project starts or during your next sprint. And then after that, of course, we need to retro the retro. So talk about the process you just went through. Maybe there's ways to improve it. Maybe there's better tooling to use, things like that. Uh, we do fully distributed retrospectives, so tooling is really important. We tried to use one whiteboard software, and it was terrible, so now we switched to a different system. In my opinion, retrospectives are the single best way to improve in your organization. Um, if you think about sports teams again, uh, players watch tape all the time. That's what they do. They go to practice. Practice is recorded, they play games, games are recorded, and then they watch that tape over and over again. They watch the tape of other teams, they watch the tape of their team. And the reason for this is because it allows people to self-identify mistakes. And when that happens, this is something that will naturally cause them to start the learning process. Uh, I think you should do retrospectives at least monthly, and preferably every two weeks or at the end of every sprint. So we'll talk about some ways you can externally learn. Uh, has anyone here made a million dollar mistake? Viewing? No? Okay. No million dollar mistake makers? Uh, this is Fred Perota. He made a million dollar mistake. Uh, so he's the CEO of a company called Tortuga. They make travel backpacks. And what happened was they had a version three of their backpacks coming out. And he had to order stock, uh, the remaining stock, for the coming months up until the backpack was released. What he didn't anticipate was that slow, uh, sales would slow because people were going to wait for B B3 to come out, and just in general, sales kind of dip below his projections. So he ended up with a million dollars worth of stock sitting on a shelf, rotting like bananas. His order was too big. And what he did is he wrote a blog post about it, and he said, look, I made a million dollar mistake. I can announce my failures, and chances are you're not making million dollar mistakes. Chances are your mistakes are much, much smaller than this. So if I can show you that I made a million dollar mistake, you can show me that you made a mistake that was much smaller. Get your mistakes out in the world. Blog, write, educate others. That way we can all learn. You could even go a step farther and live stream your mistakes. This is what GitLab does. GitLab is a competitor to GitHub. They store code for you. And every single time that they have an outage, they live stream it on YouTube. This is part of their standard operating procedures. They even have run books so that you can follow along with the step-by-step -step instructions that they're doing to fix the issue. So for me, this is important. Be transparent. Be transparent with the way that you're making mistakes and the way that you're fixing those mistakes. That way, all of us can learn. Share knowledge. Share knowledge externally. Also share knowledge within your company. If you have teams helping teams, then they will feel more comfortable relying on each other. You never want to have uh, to ask for information with inside your corporation. Teams should always be publishing that information before anyone needs it. Okay, let's move on to take action. So, what are some things that you can do? You can trust. This is the foundation before you can have psychological safety. So, you just take the lead. You start trusting others. Just like in Star Trek. So Star Trek has all these wild uh, plot lines, like I just met my clone, or that alien is really the captain, or Space Command got infested by parasites trying to take over the world. 
true, true plot lines. And what the people in Star Trek do is they believe each other. So they believe their colleagues, and then they begin to help them investigate. They don't try to question what the facts are about the situation. They just try to start investigating. So this is something you can do. Believe your colleagues when they come to you with the problem. Another thing you can do is have an anxiety party. Okay. So it's estimated that in the American workforce, 70% of people suffer from imposter syndrome, which is basically where you just want to kind of hide and hope that no one notices that you're there. You're going to be found out. They're going to know that you're not really the person that you say you are. So an anxiety party is one way to help get over that fear. What you do is you start by taking 10 minutes and on a piece of paper, you write down your biggest anxieties. Then you take a couple minutes and you sort through them with the most anxious causing items at the top of the list. And then one by one, you go around in a circle and you read off those items. And your colleagues hold up a number zero through five and they tell you how true that that item is. And if it's a three or more, you discuss it and you try to improve on it. So to give you an example, you might write down, I'm afraid I'm not a team player. And then your colleagues will score you like after this. <laughs> so this creates vulnerability. And vulnerability is really key to psychological safety. If you can be vulnerable in front of people, you can take risks in front of people. Another thing you can do is have a story exchange. This is something that was uh, used not by Obama, but by the CEO of the Obama Foundation, David Simmons. And what he did is he tried to bridge people from very different backgrounds and create empathy between these people. So what he did is he had people pair up and then they would tell each other their story. And then they would tell the other person's story in front of the whole group. And most importantly, they would use the first person. So an example is like, you tell me your story, and then I stand up and say, I did blah, 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 and I'm talking on your behalf. And this creates a really strong empathetic, empathetic link between the two people in the pair. And this is really good because empathy on your team, again, is something that is necessary for psychological safety. So reveal yourself. We work with a lot of different people. We work with a lot of different types of people from different backgrounds, and you can't just take them apart and figure out how they work. So what do you do? How do you solve this problem? Well, I'll give you an example. So I just started a new job, the one at May with Love, about a month and a half ago, and I needed some help. So what do I do? I ask for help, because I'm a good employee. And my boss says, <laughs> no, <laughs> period. I'm like, no, with a period? Oh, snap. Oh, my time is off. Oh, snap again. What's a period for? Am I going to get fired? No. But that period is a distraction. And a manager's job is to remove distractions. So, Andreas, my boss, might say, that was Photoshop. It is. There, missed the slide. Or he might say, but I always write like that. But I'm a new employee, so how do I know? Did I miss one? Okay. How do I know? You, well, you tell them. So this is what manager.readme is. Uh, manager.readme is a document that's public, and it covers the role, promises, expectations, failures, and your deepest, darkest secrets. Maybe not that. Um, it tries to answer the question, what makes me unique? So if we have the same procedures, and I have my team, and another manager has their team, what is the difference between both of us? How can I implement things different than them if we have the same procedures? That's what this document is for. So it covers who am I? Brief personal info, where you're from, where you grew up, things like that. Family and pets. Hobbies. Models and theories you prescribe to. Motivation for writing the document. It covers your role, not the title, but the actual thing that you do at your work. Uh, you want to think about your audience here. Usually it's your direct reports. Maybe it's just your team now. Um, maybe you have a side goal, like mine is helping developers be more efficient than they can possibly imagine. Maybe you have a similar goal. You also want to cover promises that you make to your team. So the one-on-one -on -one structure, um, even if it's a company-wide thing, you should definitely explicitly state this. Uh, the feedback style that you'll give them, such as like, I will critique you in private rather than in public. 
then your role is to create context, that's generally the role of a manager, and transparency, that you will never lie to them, but maybe sometimes you have to hold back information. And of course, any logistical things, like you need to use some stupid calendar startup app in order to actually schedule a meeting with me rather than just like sending me in a calendar invite. And of course, you need to also list the expectations that you have of them. So you're creating a contract with them. Expectations you have are things like that you need to provide feedback to me because I work very closely with you, so you're the best person to give me feedback. Uh, I expect you to be here from 11 to 3, for instance. Or communication, I expect you to work asynchronously and not always reply to my messages. I need you to get in the flow and do your job. And of course, not communication, like stop answering emails at 10 p.m. on Friday night. That's a really big problem for me. And you know, if they've read the values, it's probably important as well. You also want to include your failures as a manager, or most people call them quirks. So if you're negative, emotional response, or you have preferences about certain things, for instance, I'm not a morning person, so I for sure put that in my manager read me. Or if you use periods at the end of every sentence, and sometimes it's scary when you say no, period, maybe put that also in that spot. And if you under, understate or overstate feedback. So some people will understate or overstate feedback based on if it's positive or negative. Maybe every time you're giving, po giving positive feedback, you understate it. So you might just say, oh yeah, great job. And for you, you've, like, you've really told them that they did such a good job, but they don't really hear that. So if you're the manager and you write that in your document, they'll know what, if you show any emotion at all and they've done a good job, then they should feel like really good, right? You also want to edit the document. Make sure it's concise. Uh, any company-wide items don't need to be in there other than the one-on-one uh, -on -one format. And does it make sense for the audience? And every time you get a new team, you want to revisit this document. So when I talk about getting a new team, this is when every, whenever someone new is joining the team, you probably want to revisit the document. But not all of us are managers here. Um, so I didn't invent manager.readme. This is something else someone else came up with. But I extended it. And I urge you to create a colleague.readme if you're not a manager. So basically, this is an extension of the manager.readme. Again, it's a public document. It's uh, got your basic bio, your role, your approach, successes, quirks, and the most important thing, your pastry preference so that your manager can reward you. What better way than with delicious pastries? And your audience has also changed, and your audience has changed to people that are joining the team. So you've worked with the same colleagues for a long time, hopefully. And when someone joins the team, they don't really know anything about you. They don't know how you work. They don't know what's going to make you upset. They don't know if you're a morning person or a night person. Uh, they don't know what your MBTI uh, diagnostic is. So this is a way to tell them all that stuff. So I would encourage you to create a colleague.readme. So to summarize, measure formally, informally, qualitatively, quantitatively. Learn, become a learning organization, share your knowledge and take action, be vulnerable and work together. But this, we covered a lot of information, so I wanna give you some quick ones. So in my opinion, the easiest and best thing to implement first is the one-on-ones. Um, for sure, that's the low-hanging fruit. There's a podcast called Manager Tools, and they have a Manager Tools Basics, that's a podcast name, and they will walk you through exactly how to implement this. So it starts with part of your team, the people that you really don't have to worry about, and it's only positive feedback at first. And you do that for a really long time, like four weeks. And then you roll it out to everyone else. And then another four weeks passes, and then you start adding negative feedback, but only to the top performers. And then another four weeks passes, and then you roll out negative feedback to everyone. So I would highly recommend um, using a system. Sorry, that's for structured feedback. Uh, but they have similar for the one-on-one -on -one system. So start the conversation with your team. You can always implement it in your team. Even if you're not a decision maker, this is something you can do for your team. So if you're not a CEO, that's okay. You can still do it on your team. And as soon as people see that you're getting better results, they will implement it also. Uh, if you want to help things to be made with love, you can email this email address. We're always hiring, uh, mainly developers, but sometimes PMs. And you can find me on Medium, LinkedIn, and Twitter at Steve Tauber. Thank you very much. So, questions. Who's got questions?
Yes, please ask. Have you ever done an anxiety party? Have I ever done an anxiety party? I have not. I've not been to one. one. I have not been to one. I have not been. I have not been to one. Um, yeah, so one thing with the anxiety parties you have to look out for is if you have a really, let's say, um, how to put this nicely, if you have a team that likes to put a lot of blame on others, probably an anxiety party isn't going to work right off the bat. Uh, yeah, and it's really easy to pile on to people during that, so that's why you use the numbers, because it's not so much, um, oh yeah, it's totally something you do, and 10 other people agree, and they all, you know, pile on and make you feel real bad, they have the numbers, so then one person can talk about the situation. Um, the person that wrote it, they said that it, it actually, they, they were the person that had um, uh, the imposter syndrome, and they invented it to help themselves, and they said it was amazing, and they, they really have completely changed their, uh, their behavior and psychology at work, so I would recommend you try it if you have uh, imposter syndrome. Other questions? Really? Okay, cool. Maha, do you have to say something? <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a question, actually. Okay. What about remote teams? Yeah, so with remote teams, um, of course there's some obstacles. You can still do everything I talked about. The main thing is you're doing it over video chat. Uh, when you're doing video chat and you're doing one-on-ones, you want to you know, turn off your phone, put the video chat live to full screen, don't be taking notes, like write physical notes maybe, don't type on the computer. Don't respond to instant messenger, close email, close all that stuff. It's just a distraction. Your goal during one-on-ones is to create that relationship. So you need to focus on it to create the relationship. Other questions? Cool. Uh, thanks for coming to PMZG. This is the November meetup. We'll have one more meetup next month with uh, Mladen Gang and Jenita Jenny. Yeah, nothing. Uh, Jindo, and she'll be, they'll be doing their talk that they also gave a PMI for, so you should come back for that. We meet on the second Wednesday of every month at 6 p.m. here at Born Fight. Please stay around and network and try some uh, delicious snacks and, and beverages. I think that's it.